Well, welcome everybody to the very first Elsevier live webinar for today. Uh, my name is Dr. Mike Todorovic. I'm joined here with Dr. Matthew Barton. Hi guys. And we will be talking to you about the top tips for studying the biosciences. So I'm sure all of you are aware that the biosciences are anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, and pharmacology. And Matt and I are senior lecturers at Griffith University and we teach these subjects. So we will be giving you our top tips on how to best prepare and study for these particular courses. Now, just before we begin, if you wanna ask any particular questions, don't ask the questions in the chat box, ask the questions in the Q&A box. And what we'll do is we'll spend five to 10 minutes at the end of this presentation answering your questions for you. So first thing I wanna go through is a little bit of shameless promotion. So Dr. Matt and I, we have a number of social media platforms where we present material just like this on how to study anatomy and physiology, pathophysiology, pharmacology, but also the content of these courses. So the information that you actually get at university lectures on these subjects. And so if you like, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical YouTube. We've got over 65,000 subscribers at the moment, over 4 million views. We've got 250 videos telling you how the human body works. If you don't like videos and you like listening, feel free to join our podcast. So we've got a podcast called Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. You can find it on all places that offer podcasts. We're often ranked in the top 10 science podcasts and we get over 6,000 downloads a week. So Feel free, they're all free resources for you to use. Now, let's begin and talk about some of our top tips. So I'm gonna focus on anatomy and physiology, and Matt's gonna focus on pathophysiology and pharmacology. And we're gonna give you a lot of our do's, the things that you should do in order to study anatomy and physiology. But the first thing I wanna start with is a don't. So it's very common for all of us, it's our default to go into a course and start writing notes. And our notes are usually just copying from textbooks, copying from the lecture slides, copying from the course material. Don't do this. Now, the reason why I'm saying don't do this is because our brains aren't wired to write notes like this. In actual fact, we haven't evolved over thousands upon thousands of years to read textbooks and write notes. But what we have evolved to do is YouTube. Seek is what? YouTube. Yeah, watch YouTube. So watch your YouTube. But what, apart from YouTube, what we've evolved to do is to seek and recognize patterns. And so what Matt and I are going to talk to you about are some ways that you can turn studying into pattern recognition. And this is hijacking the brain and using it to its advantage in order for you to understand the best way to work through so you're hacking physiology to learn physiology. How good is that? You're hacking the brain to use the brain to learn about the brain. Isn't that That's meta? Deep. That's very deep. So don't just copy. Let me tell you what, I get at the end of every single semester, I get a student coming up to me who have failed the course, unfortunately, and they say, why have I failed this course? And they show me their notebook and they've filled a notebook with writing. And I have a look at the notes and they are identical to the lecture notes, what I've presented in the lecture. And I say to the student, you haven't been studying, you've just been transcribing. So just writing notes isn't studying. So let's talk about some of the do's, especially for anatomy and physiology. So the first thing I wanna talk about is medical terminology. So when you learn anatomy and physiology, you're not just learning about all these structures, bones and muscles, and how they interplay in the interactions and the physiology, but you're also learning a new language. Two, is, maybe. Yeah, Latin and Greek. There we go. And so what we recommend is spending time in the front end, going through some of this medical terminology. You don't have to go through all of it, but there are some common what we call prefixes, they sit at the start of the word, and suffixes that sit at the end of the word that repeat over and over and over again. So for example, a common prefix that you may see is myo. Matt, what does myo mean? Um, muscle. Muscle, okay. What about chondro? Cartilage. What about peri? A spice you put on chicken. Oh, okay. Again, what's it mean medically? Around? Okay, around. So you'll see these prefixes come up over and over and over again. So if you know what they mean, you can start, you don't actually need to see the word before, but if you can break up the prefixes and suffixes, you'll understand what it means. What about the suffix site? To look. No, 
<laughs> a cell. Cell. What about itis? Inflammation. And do you know what O-G-E-N or O-G-E-N means? I always thought it means to generate. No, it means stored or inactive. Oh, okay, go. so when we take these terms, you may have a word that comes up that you've never seen before. It's a long and it may be, yeah, it may be a big, long, complex word like angiotensinogen. And you may go, oh, I'm, I'm done. I quit. But if you learn your prefixes and suffixes, you can break this word up. Angio means blood vessel. Tensin means to stretch. And like we said, ogen means it's stored or inactive. Angiotensinogen is a stored or inactive molecule that needs to become activated. And when it does, it plays around with the diameter of blood vessels. And Makes if sense. you understand AMP, it means if you play around with the diameter of blood vessels, you play around with blood pressure. That's right. So angiotensinogen, just by looking at it and using the medical terminology, you already know that this molecule is important for blood pressure. And this is how medical terminology can help. That's my first top tip. Now, my second tip is mnemonics. So this is using pattern recognition in the term, in, in, using words, right? So common words that you use to remember more complex words. And this is a great way to memorize big extensive lists. So when you do anatomy, knowing bones, knowing muscles, knowing nerves, this huge, long, extensive list you need to know, and they're all complex names. But if you utilize mnemonics, it's a great way to help. So what I've got up here on the screen is one of the most complex lists that you're gonna remember for neuroanatomy, which is gonna be the 12 cranial nerves, the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. And you can see them here. You've got olfactory, optic, ocular motor, and they're big, long, complex words. Now, the great thing is, we can take what we learned in the first study tip, which is medical terms. medical terms, and we can use it to break some of these terms up to understand what they do. So for example, glosso. What does glosso mean? Tongue. Tongue. What does pharyngeal mean? Pharynx? Yeah, back of the throat. So glossopharyngeal means this nerve plays around with the tongue and maybe the back of the throat, which it does. Hypo, what does hypo mean? Below. And what does glossal mean? Again, that's tongue. So below tongue. So maybe this nerve plays around with a muscle that's sitting below the tongue, tells it to move. What about trigeminal? Ooh, tri would be three. That's right. Geminal, geminus? Like the star sign? Yeah, Gemini, which just means born together. So trigeminal means three born together because there's three branches of the trigeminal nerve. Right. So as you can see, here's, you can use the first tip for this one. So you understand what the words mean? Mean, and now we can memorize them by using a mnemonic. Right. So instead of memorizing these complex words, we can say, oh, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet, ah, heaven. These are simpler words, and it's an easy way to remember. And we can take these particular words, and we take the first letter from each word and it tells us what the actual word is. Now, here's the thing. If you have a question in an exam and it says, what is the 12th cranial nerve? And you go, I don't know. You can write this mnemonic down and go, heaven, it starts with H. There's only one that starts with H. It must be hypoglossal. So this is a way to utilize certain techniques like mnemonics. Now, the last tip that I have before I pass on to Matt is drawing. Now, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone. I did it earlier today. Yes, so you can see behind us, uh, Matt's doing some embryology. Uh, now, Matt's not the best drawer. That's true. right? But he does get his point across in his drawings because drawing is ridiculously helpful. All my lectures are drawn. I don't use lecture slides or anything in my lectures. They're all drawn because if I can do it, you can do it. And so the great thing about drawing is that it allows you to demonstrate your understanding. All right? And if you can draw it, it means you understand homeostasis and all physiological functions is homeostasis. It may be the response to you trying to get kicked out of homeostasis and return to homeostasis, or it's just demonstrating what homeostasis is. The other thing that's great is when you draw, it allows for you to manipulate concepts in your mind. It allows you to take words and turn it into images. And if you can do this, you can understand it. And you don't even need to be a good drawer. I mean, look at Matt. He's a perfect example. He's terrible at drawing, but he still gets his point across with the drawings. And so these are my top three tips. Understand the medical terminology, create mnemonics for lists that are complex, and draw, draw, 
draw. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Matt. All right. So for my tip, so the, the bioscience tip for what I'll be covering today is around the concept of pathophysiology or the context of pathophysiology, should I say. So patho means what? Uh, disease. Right. So this is the understanding of how the process of diseases occur. Okay. So for my tip of just today is visual mapping. Now, if there's one thing I want you to take away from, from my session today, there is three words to learn, to store and retrieve. And those three things is essentially what you'll be doing with visual mapping. So with the visual mapping, there's kind of two aspects we're going to cover today, mind maps and concept maps. You may have heard of these terms. You may actually think they're the same, but they're actually different. So firstly, the mind map, the mind map works with just one single concept. Today, we're going to do the concept of heart failure. So it's one single concept with discrete packages of information, usually color coded. Whereas the concept map integrates a number of different concepts together, puts it in one connected map, which makes it much easier for your brain to work with. And then ultimately you learn it, you store it, and you can then retrieve it. So in a typical course or a unit, your educator, your teacher, your lecturer would give you a whole heap of learning outcomes or learning objectives that you need to learn. For this semester just finished for my students, they had to know 56 learning outcomes. Yeah, that's a lot. So how do the students actually um, answer the, the learning outcomes? Well, today's example was a heart failure. So an example of a learning outcome around heart failure might be, please explain how the etiology, the cause, and the risk factors lead to heart failure, which then through a mechanism causes the clinical manifestations, which are the signs and symptoms, and how are the diagnostic and treatments modality used to manage heart failure. That's a lot of stuff, man. It's a lot of stuff. So what students would do is then they would go to certain places to be able to answer that question. So they might go to my lectures, read my notes, watch my video, go to the textbook, like the one on the screen, and have a, a read about heart failure. Or they might go on to online resources like... Uh, our YouTube channel, Dr. Matt, Dr. Mike's Medical YouTube. Right. But what students always do, and Mike spoke about this at the start, they just transcribe it. So they just rewrite what's in the textbook, rewrite what's in the lecture notes, and it just becomes the same thing. Now, Mike, does your brain store information like what we see on that white piece of paper? No, I couldn't do that. So your brain doesn't store it like that. So why do you try to put the information into your brain that way? For, ex for instance, I'm going to say a word to you guys, and I want you to think what pops into your consciousness the first time you hear this word. All right, we ready? The word is pineapple. Okay. What comes to mind when you hear the word pineapple? Uh, unsurprisingly, a pineapple, a picture, an image of an actual pineapple. Right. So this fruit with a green top, yellow, Yeah, I think rough, people know what right. pineapples are, yeah. But you don't. Oh. You don't remember P-I-N-E-A-P-P-L-E, -P -P no. do you? I don't spell the word in my head. Right. And so why are you trying to put information into your head that way? Good point. Okay. So mind map. Let's break down this piece of paper into discrete packages. So firstly, let's color code it, okay? And then let's destroy the piece of paper <laughs> and make it into a map. So straight away, that's much easier for your brain to make sense of, right? So how a mind map works is you have a blank piece of paper, you turn it horizontal, and in the middle of the piece of paper, you have the topic. In this case, it's heart failure. Nice and centered in the middle. Now a mind map works by radiating outwards, with different discrete packages of information that you need to know. For instance, up the top right, we have the risk factors. Here are a list of risk factors that go with heart failure, such as smoking, diabetes, age, sex. On the top left, we have the etiology or the cause, such as hypertension or a heart attack. Across to the side, we have clinical manifestations in red, different signs and symptoms. Down on the left, we have the treatments. Down on the right, we have diagnostics. This is much easier for your brain to manage and then store it because first of all, you need to learn it to be able to put it into discrete packages, store it. And then when it comes to your exam, much easier to kind of retrieve it. But how do we link them up? So I want to know how the risk factors play a role in the etiology or the cause and why 
dyspnea is a clinical manifestation of heart failure. So how do we link all that up right. so that it actually makes sense? So this then moves to the concept map. And so the concept map is slightly different to the mind map. The concept map actually puts it all together. So to do a concept map, you actually have to understand the information a bit deeper. But the advantage of doing that is then you retain it and it will stay in your brain for a longer period. So the difference first with the concept map is you have the title of the screen or the paper being the topic. So it's going to be heart failure at the top. Whereas the center point is more the cause. Okay. So one of the causes that we did list in the mind map was the heart attack or the STEMI, ST elevated myocardial infarction. So that's a heart attack. Right. Oh, okay. So this is one of the most common causes that lead to heart failure. But a heart attack just doesn't come out of nowhere, right? you have to have certain risks that associate to it. So a risk factor is something that increases the likelihood of a cause occurring. Okay, so a classic example of heart failure risk is smoking. Now we would have just kept smoking on a discrete um, location for the mind map, but now we want to understand how the smoking links to the cause. Okay, so this is where you need to go away and briefly understand a bit of pathophysiology, which is the title of this particular so the disease process. Right. Okay. So what you can see here on the left-hand side is your key. This is the color-coded words that you need to be able to put into your map. And you can see in green is the pathophysiology. So instead of having, you know, a, a paragraph or half a page of the pathophysiology of how smoking leads to a heart attack, you break it down into little bite-side trigger points that will make sense to you. Okay. So for instance, you smoke, you breathe in a whole lot of chemicals, you absorb it from your lungs into your blood. These chemicals will then go and damage endothelial cells, specifically in your coronary arteries. These are the arteries that supply your heart, leading to atherosclerosis, which is plaque formation. And then that decreases blood to your heart. Now you get a heart attack. Okay, so now you've just linked smoking to a disease process to the cause of heart failure. Correct. All right. And you used it, you've done it with two steps. All right. Right. Much easier for your brain to work with than having a paragraph to read through. What about some clinical manifestations? Right. So a common side symptom of heart failure is crackles, particularly left-sided heart failure. Crackles just means you have fluid in your alveoli down at the base of your lungs. So from here, you need to understand how does heart attack lead into crackles. Again, you have to go away and learn your pathophysiology to a certain extent, but then make some important steps that link it together. So we have the heart attack. We all know that heart attack is essentially causing death of myocardial, myo muscle, cardio cells. Ah, good work. Okay. Uh, it, therefore, if you reduce the amount of muscle in your heart, the pumping ability decreases. Therefore, the contractility decreases. Therefore, the amount of blood leaving the heart per stroke decreases. Therefore, the amount of blood leaving the heart per minute decreases. That means the blood's not going out of the aorta. That means it goes backwards. It goes back into the left atria, back into the pulmonary veins, back into the lungs. And what do we have? We have edema. Okay. Leading and to crackles. So then all this fluid goes out into your alveoli, into your lung tissue. And that means you now get a symptom called crackles. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now you want to somehow figure out how do the diagnostics link in. So what we saw in the mind map, we just had a package of the different diagnostic tests. But with the concept map, you actually learn on how it fits in. So an, a test that you can do is a physical examination, such as auscultation, which is a stethoscope. You listen to your patient, patient's chest and you hear crackling, okay, particularly when they breathe in. That's the fluid causing the, the alveoli to pop open on inspiration. Now, by doing this, you understand how it actually works, okay, how the diagnostic test actually fits into the process. And then finally, what about the treatment? Well, a common treatment for heart failure, particularly with left-sided, but also right, is the diuretic. So a diuretic is a drug that increases the urine output of the patient, gets rid of the fluid overload. Now, in a left-sided heart failure case, that will get rid of the fluid overload in the lungs. That will remove the edema. Hopefully, that will help manage the heart failure. Now, what you can see here, we've just done one kind of arm of the whole heart failure. So we've just done kind of one risk factor and one clinical manifestation and the diagnostics and treatment. But if you put the whole heart failure together, then you have a very full concept map. So what I like about this is that the very first thing you showed us was a piece of paper with just 
lists. It just said, here are the diagnostics, here are the treatments, here's the etiology and so forth. But what we've done here is allowed for your mind to understand where it fits into the whole process. So instead of just knowing that dyspnea or shortness of breath is a clinical manifestation of heart failure, we can see here where it fits in, so why, and if there's any particular diagnostic tests to determine it. And so it's a great way of consolidating your understanding. Yes. And like I said at the start, to do this, you've got to learn it first, but now you can store it and then finally you can retrieve it. So when it's exam time, it's much easier for you to understand and make sense of the information and to answer the questions that are in the exam. Absolutely. So that's the tips from both anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology. Please guys, questions? Yes, yeah, so we can see that there's some questions in the Q&A box. 